I'd like to welcome you all to MDIBL. It would be much nicer to welcome you at MDIBL. Uh, the Zoom presentation gives me the unusual opportunity to welcome you right at the entrance of MDIBL. You're aware that at such a meeting in front of the sign and uh, we have to take care not to be run over by cars in Route 3. It would be very nice to stroll down with you and uh, show you what has happened, uh, what MDIBL looks like, uh, but that's not possible. So I'll talk about what happened over the last year. We are in a very strange situation because on the one hand, we had a wonderful year. I mean, you'll see a lot of things happened a lot of improvement. The lab actually, uh, with the faculty, with new recruits, uh, you will see this was a success story. And then on the other hand, we had COVID-19. We also weathered the storm, and I'll talk about this in a minute. And I first like to report what happened during COVID-19 over the last couple of months at MDI. Next slide, please, Jerry. COVID-19 at MDIBL was relatively easy as compared to other places in the country. Maine was not spared, but we had much less infections to other states. We had wonderful leadership. So, uh, uh, no infections. We came up with clear policies and procedures and very important, timely and transparent communication. Although we had uh, not a lot of infections uh, in the county, the level of anxiety, as you can imagine, was high. So we put up posters, we talked to all staff uh, a lot, we did a lot of communication, and we also supported our staff. Uh, we have started the employee assistance program, and I'll talk about this in a moment. We have now recently, and here it is, that's an assistance program where <laughs> due, uh, because of the uh, help, of all of you and uh, the lab community, we can assist members of the MDIBL community who experience an anticipated financial hardship or crisis. And that's very helpful because people feel safe at the lab. So we provide financial assistance for housing, transportation. This is relatively free. The maximum grant of a thousand dollars. Can I have the next slide, please? And most of all, <laughs> this was the work of the senior leadership team. Everybody worked very hard during that time. So actually, we had no lockdown. We were slowing down. Uh, but our animal facility was up and running and uh, the time of COVID-19 brought us all much closer together. There was a lot of community feeling. We had regular meetings uh, several times during the week uh, and some of us, Mark, can you still hear me? Yes. Jerry, can you still hear me? Yes, I can. So everybody was working very hard. Uh, Claudine took over at, as min, administrative director during this difficult time and she worked very hard on, on regulations and she made everybody feel safe and protected at the lab. Uh, Jerry helped with communication and keeping everybody informed. Mark was essential in his crew to keep us all safe. Uh, and uh, the educational team with Jane and Chris 
they had to do with the help of Roy an extraordinary job. And I'll talk briefly about that because our educational program is now online. Can I have the next slide? So all our courses and conferences uh, went virtual. We have successfully held six online courses thus far. We had, and I'll talk briefly about that, a symposium actually on campus online, which was a success. We viewed posters, we talked to students, students could ask questions and we could answer them. And this means that we are finding it's not all that to be online, sometimes communication is even better. We had the bioinformatic courses, a grant workshop which was very successful, the undergraduate course, the SIPA course, and we have still a couple of courses coming. You can see the students here, these are pictures they sent us from home <clears throat> and they worked hard. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we had the annual MBMSS meeting online. And I already told you that it was very successful. I talked via Zoom to students. I had a look at posters and uh, it was informative. And Jane and Chris and Roy did a great job uh, running this meeting. Next slide, please. We also have our traditional summer course, although it's very different. We have 23 research fellows, REU undergrads, INBRI students, high school students. We have 16 mentors uh, and uh, we are coordinating six main institutions. It's very different, but I've been giving lectures and we have good communication. Uh, we get accustomed to it actually. And I think in the coming years, we'll use some of the tools we have established now, and we will combine this with a presence on campus and courses on campus. Next slide, please. And now I'll talk about uh, the development at the lab where we stand in 2020 after 122 years of discovery. As you all know, MDIBL is small, so it's all about scientific excellence. And over the last 100 years, it has been a place where excellent researchers came to and flocked to, and the interaction between these researchers is what made MDIBL. So we are serving as an international gathering place for scientists around the world. And we have an outstanding scientific education and outreach program. And I've just demonstrated this to you. It's still up and running. And this creates enthusiasm for scientific discovery. We had uh, very nice and friendly remarks for students about our program, even <clears throat> during these difficult times. And it builds relationships that last for generations as most of you have experienced. Next slide, please. So this is our vision. Recruitment of outstanding faculty and staff, and I'll talk about this in a moment, investing in technology and innovation, expanding opportunities for visiting scientists, strengthening our research training programs, building partnerships throughout Maine and beyond, and translating our research into the biomedical arena. And all these points have been improved. We have achieved quite a bit over the last year, despite the COVID epidemic. And if we would not have had the epidemic, it would have been only a wonderful presentation. And now with a little bit of bitterness, uh, about what happened over the last uh, four months. I'll present to you. I will be very brief on the science because Ian Drummond will talk about that uh, and will inform you. Next slide, please. 
Just a short overview, MDIBL faculty, these are the people in some phases are new here. Rayak Muravala, you will listen to in a moment, and Romain Madeleine, they are our latest recruits. At the moment, they are still in Europe and waiting to come. Next slide, please. We have new animal models. Ian will talk about the African killifish, and we are going to establish renal organoids, stem cell derived organoids on campus, which is quite an improvement to the already existing animal models. Next slide. We are at the moment establishing new microscopes. Uh, we got from our grants a major microscope, and Ian will talk about that. Next slide. And we will invest in lab space. We have new recruits at the moment, that's all fine, but we need more space in the future. And uh, we have submitted a grant for the renovation of Neil, uh, which will provide us with extra lab space for new recruits. And Karnofsky is another possibility. So no new buildings at the moment, but renovation of existing lab space. Next slide. What does the future hold? Excellence, diversity, and retention. Diversity is very important. You can see our faculty here, and uh, this is a wonderful group of scientists, of excellent scientists. One small disadvantage, they're all male. So we need excellence, but we need diversity, and we have to keep our scientists on campus, and we need support for that as well. I've mentioned the new models. With the new models and with the new researchers come also new diseases. Macular degeneration, one of the leading causes of blindness, is addressed in the work of Roman because he works on eye regeneration. And we have a small research project in my lab on COVID-19, because you may remember, I'm very much interested in the sugar coating of cells, especially in the vasculature. And COVID-19 binds first to these sugar coated proteins and we are trying to prohibit that. We will move into the unknown. You know that Dustin is working on membraneless organelles. That's a fascinating uh, research project for the future. We're working on nuclear architecture. Our imaging will go to the next level even after we have established our new microscope and we will work on arti artificial intelligence, both for our research, but also we want to train the next generation of scientists in artificial intelligence. Next slide. One example, and I think it's a very good example, and I have used it before, and some of you have heard this before. You need vision and courage for the research we are carrying out because we work with cells. We have projects which are very early when we think about regeneration of organs and limbs. And you can see this on the right hand side here with the stem cell derived organoid. Now, if you want to go from here, where we are at the moment, to the architecture of the kidney, and some of you know and understand this very well, this is complicated. But it has only been, and this is where the vision comes into place, it has only been a hundred years since the Wright brothers were standing on this sand dune, and now we have uh, these <coughs> airplanes, and they are so complicated, they're almost as complicated as human organs, limbs, or the kidney. So this is why it's so fascinating to be a researcher, 
but it's also this spirit of vision and courage which we are transporting in which we are living at Mount, uh, Mount Esther Island Biological Laboratory. Next slide. Next slide. Expanding opportunities for visiting scientists. I'm very proud that uh, the visiting scientists program is not something like addition, in addition to the faculty, but the faculty initiated collaborations have grown considerably. So the visiting scientists are now coming directly into the labs of our faculty. Our goal is to have 15 groups, four to seven long-term members who will be part of our visiting faculty. And the challenges are considerable. We need leadership for these groups. We need space and we need funding. We have international funding for the visiting scientist program and and we are very thankful for the support uh, we have from Maine, from Salisbury Cove Research Fund, so, but for this program, we need more support. Next slide. Next slide, please. For the visiting scientist program, <laughs> uh, all right, for, can we go back one? Yes, I think there's a slight delay. I apologize. Yeah, for the uh, op well, don't show me these pictures. I'm, I'm, <laughs> the uh, for the visiting scientists, uh, we need renovation of cottages, and Mark and his crew have done a wonderful job over the last couple of months, working throughout the pandemic to renovate cottages. We have to renovate Bone Hall and we're working on this a committee in order to expand and to modernize our campus. And now the next slides, this shows you one example of how we renovate. And some of you remember Goldstein, the cottage, and uh, remember the wonderful... Next slide, please. Jerry, if, if his connection dies, I can, I can do my best to fill in. <laughs> okay, I think between the two of us, we might be able to do it. <laughs> Certainly no. There we go. So I know... Um, and one of the things that we um, really highlighted as a goal this year was to strengthen our research training programs. And as Dr. Haller indicated earlier in his remarks, the communications, the uh, education team here has done an amazing job of pivoting and creating virtual opportunities for our students to engage in uh, hands-on research, much of which is now computationally focused in terms of honing bioinformatics skills and the ability to analyze complex data sets. So that's been a major uh, component of the 2020 research training program. Ian, do that you have any really comments? Well, that works really well online too. So that's really lended itself to the current situation. I'll just add to Jerry's comments that we've made a major effort to leverage MDIBL's international reputation to recruit graduate students from Europe. Uh, we had four students from the University of Paris uh, lined up to come, uh, we, visas and all, but uh, of course the pandemic put an end to that. But we see this as an ongoing program for the future, uh, both recruiting from graduate schools in France, Germany, uh, and expanding to other universities. And you find there's a real appetite to come to MDIBL uh, for not only the location, uh, but the cutting edge uh, research and opportunities there that they don't really see other places. Uh, there's, there's a draw for postdocs to join the regeneration um, and aging programs we have 
And I think that our, our focus on that has given us an international draw. Um, we seek funding from uh, foreign countries, so it's a win-win for us if we can get a, a, a smart young investigator who's funded by their home country, so that, that can work well. Uh, and we are moving towards uh, having MDIBL be a visa granting or visa sponsoring organization um, so we can really uh, ramp this up. Uh, Herman has um, made arrangements with Hanover and, and his university to supply up to 10 graduate students per year. And our goal would be to have at least one postdoc and one graduate student in each lab funded through these programs. Uh, so this again uh, highlights the graduate student program as an international program and uh, the structure and support we're putting behind it is, is funding and uh, visa support so we can really broaden our draw. Yeah. And this is what we need because uh, we need more researchers, we need more young people uh, in our labs and uh, we have to expand uh, the research groups and we have to expand the campus. Can I have the next slide please? Thank you very much Terry and Ian for you know taking over and mending these problems. It takes our a outreach program, our, sorry? I said it takes a village at MDIBO. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the spirit I was talking about, you know, lots of meetings, uh, very close collaborations. Uh, the last, but not least, is our outreach program. Uh, this is the CEPA program, you know, which is uh, from a grant of uh, Jane Disney. And uh, we are covering the education and the training of young people really on all levels, outreach programs, uh, the graduate program Ian has just mentioned. Uh, I'm very proud that we can have international students. We still will have students from Maine on campus, but uh, we will run a graduate program with more than 10 graduate students, and this is what we need. Next slide, please. So the challenges, and Ian already has mentioned that, uh, the visa programs, uh, we will issue our own visas from MDIBL. We are establishing this at the moment, and hopefully with the recent development of, with the government, we'll be able to hand out visas uh, for all our scientists. At the moment, Brian Moravala and Romain are still waiting with their H-1B visas to come to the US. For these programs, we need funding. And we need, with Sherry's help, greater awareness and marketing of our educational programs worldwide. Next slide. So, building partnerships throughout Maine and beyond. The pandemic Next slide, please, has also helped here. Uh, we never had this before, but we had weekly meetings with the Jackson Lab, with the hospital, with the College of the Atlantic, and uh, this also not only helped during the pandemic, but we talked about uh, projects together. Uh, the College of the Atlantics and MDIBL We'll have workshops on artificial intelligence and these discussions came up during these pandemic meetings. Uh, there are fellowships at Mount Desert Island Hospital. There is one student from Hanover, independent from me, Hanover Medical School, and we have other students there and we'll strengthen this. But most importantly, our collaborations with the Jackson Laboratory are improving. All MDIBL research groups have now active collaborations with the Chaks. We have a chunk position uh, and uh, we are developing very interesting programs. There is one patent which is actually belongs to MDIBL, but it was generated in one of these collaborations. And with the University of Maine, there is also much more collaboration. There is one co in preparation 
uh, Roman Madeleine is already writing a project for this uh, Copri and uh, Ian is working together with the people at the University of Maine on this Copri and there will be a zebrafish facility. We have collaborations on zebrafish models. Uh, they are interested in toxicology uh, and the first genetic field study on chronic renal disease has started and uh, I am on that board and I help structure as an MD this genetic study. Next slide, please. Translating our research. We have always been involved in biomedical research and uh, a lot of our discoveries and uh, inventions at MDIBL have become important. And you all remember uh, Bob Maron uh, and his discovery. Judy Sproul has been very active during the last year and during the last couple of months uh, to come up with a program where we educate our faculty in patent application and transfer. We have now a manual, which you can see here on the left-hand side, with instructions for everybody how to proceed if you want to translate your research. Judy has been very active with other institutions in the state of Maine. Uh, that we become important as a technology hub of excellence uh, and we are part of several networks in the state now. You can see in the middle the plans we have for that. So the lower labs, not Neil, because this will be part of where we carry out our research, but the other smaller labs will be part of an MDI biospace and uh, we have submitted a grant with a lot of money we are asking for from MGI and the state of Maine for the renovation of Neil. And hopefully we can report next time that we have this money and we can start. Mark and his crew, they stand there and wait to work on Neil. We have three companies at the moment on campus, and I'm very proud to report that we have two provisional patents, which are almost there. Our lawyers are working, we have lawyers in Boston working together with Judy on that, and uh, these seem to be important patents. Next slide. We are strengthening our administrative structure. We are growing. Uh, we need more support. We know that and we'll discuss this during the board meeting, but it is all about people. Last year, Ian Drummond joined as a scientific director uh, and he is doing a great job. Our faculty trusts him. He's guiding them. Uh, and uh, helping them to get more grants and to improve their science. And uh, the discussions we are having uh, are much better. He's a great mentor and a great guidance. And then we were lucky that Claudine agreed to come and work as administrative director. She is at the moment still doing both director of finances and administrative director. And this is hard. We are trying to recruit and make life for her easier. Next slide, please. But this is the leadership team. The three of us, uh, Claudine, Ian and me, we started and we had in the beginning daily meetings just to understand how this functions. Can we go back one? And you can see here the departments uh, Claudine is directly working with, the departments I'm directly responsible for, and Ian, the scientific director, is not only responsible for all the faculty, but all the core facilities. You can see here there are new names, and uh, Ian will talk about that. We have restructured, he has restructured the animal core, uh, the animal 
core facility. But on the left-hand side, you can see in red new people. We have uh, two days ago, Hook Wheeler signed and he will join us uh, as head of uh, HR. And I have to acknowledge Chris Riemann because she stepped in. And for the last couple of months, especially during this crisis, she has done an excellent job in uh, providing our staff with uh, the expertise uh, and the knowledge and the security in HR. We have Brian Moravala and Romain McLean, and Ian will talk about that. Uh, so we have new people, we have better people, and I think we have a good structure and a good organizational structure for the future. Next slide. We have a challenge. We have a $1 million challenge, and Jerry, I'd like you to take over because you are the one, <laughs> you should tell us a little bit where we stand and what the challenge actually is. Thank you, Dr. Haller. Um, we are just extremely excited about the opportunity to leverage a very generous $1 million gift that the laboratory received this year. And really, I think you've done an excellent job of outlining for everyone what's at stake. Um, I think the laboratory has worked so hard to really recruit and retain outstanding scientists and also develop cutting edge educational programs and continue to try and translate our research into uh, applicable human um, treatments for disease. And so by matching this $1 million gift, we have really a, a wonderful opportunity to ensure that we are able to achieve this vision for the institution and to continue the 122 year legacy of the MDI Biological Laboratory. Um, I am particularly excited to have an opportunity to work with a group of volunteers, uh, the MDI BO uh, President's Cabinet. So please um, join me in expressing some appreciation to Jane Harrison, Anna Maynard, and Rob Whitman, who have signed on to work with Dr. Haller and my team as we uh, strive to achieve this $1 million goal. Um, the President's Cabinet will be focusing primarily on Star Point Society membership. So this is a wonderful opportunity if you have ever considered joining our Star Point Society with an entry level gift of $250 or more. This is a wonderful time to do that because your, uh, your new membership will be matched and it will credit or um, go toward allowing us to meet this $1 million challenge. Thanks to everyone's hard work, we have raised about $350,000 toward this challenge this year, uh, but we have a long way to go and that will take everyone's effort. And so I wanna just quickly share with you um, some thoughts about ways that you can help. So certainly financial contributions are, are, are definitely needed and appreciated. But everyone um, can have an opportunity to really help increase awareness of what we know is an extraordinarily special community and one that we are all privileged to be part of. I, I think um, one of the hidden benefits of COVID-19 has been the realization that there really are no geographical boundaries any longer for MDIBL. And I think today's meeting, despite some of our technology challenges and internet connectivity challenges, um, really sh shows that more than anything. We have uh, an international group of folks here uh, attending this meeting today. And I think that really opens up some phenomenal opportunities to engage and to increase uh, the philanthropic support of the MDI Biological Laboratory. So we wanna encourage you to consider a, a, about five different ways that you may be able to participate and really help us move the laboratory forward. And the first is to share your story. So tell us why the MDI Biological Laboratory matters to you. What does it mean to you, to your family? We know that this community, uh, as Dr. Haller mentioned earlier, generates relationships that last for years and, and for numerous generations. And so we would love to be able to hear those stories and share them with others. So um, that's one important thing to keep in mind. 
The second is to volunteer. In short, we need more hands, and we know that all of you have tremendous talents that could assist us in moving the laboratory forward. And I think the President's Cabinet would agree, as well as our Board of Trustees would agree, that we need more folks to be involved in, in, um, in achieving this vision. So whether it's um, you have some mad administrative skills that you would like to, to donate to the lab, or perhaps you'd like to be a mentor to an outstanding student, perhaps you even have uh, the capacity to volunteer to train or teach, teach at one of our courses. Uh, there are multitudes of ways that you can stay involved and extend your expertise to MDIBO. Along those lines, we also hope you'll consider being an ambassador. So if you were here as a student, for example, and you are curious about what happened to that tall, lanky kid who played the guitar from the University of Michigan, uh, we'd love to help you connect with that person and, and to really be an ambassador for the amazing work that the laboratory is doing. And finally, we really want to encourage you to stay connected with us. So stay up to date, make sure that you are subscribed to our online communications, whether it's our e-news that goes out on a monthly basis, uh, receiving our, our printed publications, or just receiving invitations for events such as our science cafes and other activities, which are now largely centered uh, online and available virtually to everyone. And finally, of course, uh, charitable contributions, donating to support the work of this institution. As Tom Boyd mentioned in his treasurer's report, we have uh, been successful in creating a reserve fund to support the, the faculty recruitment, but we are depleting those funds. And this $1 million challenge will really help ensure that the laboratory continues to be such a critical part um, of, for all of us uh, of this community and that we can continue to uh, support the work going forward. Thank you very much, Cherry. Uh, that was uh, necessary. We need support. Uh, can I have the next slide? I hope I was uh, able to tell you how successful we have been over the last year, despite the crisis. Uh, Ian mentioned very early on, uh, we have to hit the ground running when the epidemic is over. Ian, I think we are running. <laughs> despite, and the crisis is not over yet. But there is a new dawn at MDIBL. We are rapidly growing, and I would like to thank you all for your help and support over the last years in order to achieve that, and we're looking forward to do this together. And now I can hand over to Ian, because he will talk about what really drives us. He will. I've been talking about flying, but he'll talk about the motor, which actually allows us. So thank you very much. This is our community standing together without masks, uh, no distance. Uh, I hope we will be back. I'm a scientist. I'm optimistic. Uh, the first trials with the vaccine have been successful. So let's hope that we'll have better weather next year when we have our next hike on campus. Thank you very much. And Ian, now it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Herman. Um, I'm Ian Drummond. I'm the new director of the Katherine Davis Center for Regenerative Medicine and Aging. And my job is to give you an overview of where we're at in research, talk a bit about each investigator and how we're helping them become successful and cutting edge with new technology and models. And just as a as a comic aside, I see all my faculty as superheroes uh, driving uh, MDIBL forward. Um, so the next slide. Uh, Ian, Ian, this is Ed. Uh, forgive me for breaking in. I tried to catch in between uh, Herman and you with my mute on. Um, if you just uh, allow me a moment to say for the members of the corporation tuning in who may not have been able to keep up with the developments in the lab in the last year and year and a half that um, on the behalf of the board and I think by amplification on behalf of um, all of the corporation uh, just our thanks to uh, Ian, Jerry, uh, Amy, um, Claudine, uh, so many, uh, Mark, so many uh, of the staff, uh, some veterans, some coming new to the lab uh, who have really brought us through some very, very challenging times logistically, financially, and now with the COVID 
virus and all of its many dimensions. Uh, and to welcome you aboard, Ian, because you have been an extraordinary um, addition of great scientific and administrative strength to the lab, um, but also um, a, a huge asset in uh, helping to bring our junior faculty uh, even farther along in their careers. So um, thanks, thanks for the progress made and the progress we can look forward to. Well, thank you, Ed. Thanks for your vote of confidence. And I would say from my perspective, MDIBL really is a cooperative team and it's, it's a great place to work because of that. Uh, so thank you. Um, I'll, I'll uh, further on with uh, talking about the, my team, the, the faculty, and I guess just as a, a general uh, view of the faculty, I see them as our capital. They're, we're in the business of innovation, discovery, and each new insight we have is potentially new funding, new development of careers, new recruitment. Uh, and so that's really uh, the mission and vision I see is recruit the best new talent, support their development as leaders, build synergy beyond individual labs and teams, and then leverage MDIBL's international renown to an even higher level. So we are expecting and, and coaching our, our faculty to be international leaders in aging and regeneration research. We want them to make MDIBL a destination for their research peers, and it's a great environment for hosting meetings and small symposia. Um, Herman's also mentioned the summer visiting scientists. Uh, we see this as a synergy between the, the visitors and the uh, lab investigators, the PIs, as a way to bolster their career as well as build a, a broader professional network. I mentioned briefly the recruitment of, of grad students and postdocs. We have to grow our numbers in the lab. It's a beautiful facility. I'd like to see it crammed with people. And I think we can broaden our, our range by looking at the best from Europe to come to MDIBL. And then finally, of course, we're all uh, responsible for generating funding. And as I go through the names, we'll talk a bit about the broad impact of our faculty and where we see opportunity. So the next slide uh, launches in. Dustin's one of our stars, Dustin Updike. He is studying how germ cells maintain their pluripotency and prevent their differentiation so they can become all different cell types in a, in a body. He studies these remarkable little structures here shown in green called uh, P-bodies that are, are basically gatekeepers for uh, gene expression. And beyond their, their function and pluripotency and maintaining the ability of, for instance, of germ cells and stem cells to really become any kind of tissue, they're a fascinating new understanding of how the cytoplasm is organized. There's no membranes around these things. They are somehow phase separated from their, the neighboring cytoplasm. And his work, looking at the structure of these, the proteins in it are really gonna uh, open up a new understanding of how cells work. Uh, next slide. Is from the Rogers lab, Eric is really pushed uh, understanding of aging and a fairly well-known phenomenon now is this dietary restriction can extend lifespan, but it wasn't known until uh, Eric's work that really different tissues in an organism respond differently to this treatment, and they signal to each other uh, to regulate lifespan. And so with this kind of new understanding, you can see that the signals that uh, function between organs become new targets for lifespan extension, and, and Eric Eric and Dustin's lab are both R01 funded to carry out this work. And each new angle and discovery is a new opportunity for more funding and growing their lab. The next slide. Herman, of course, has been a leader in vascular biology for decades. And what's really interesting about his work is that his work on how the sugars on the surface of cells influence the signals they receive uh, even plays out in the new uh, COVID-19 biology, which is very mysterious, but obviously affecting the endothelium. And so uh, Herman has done uh, remarkable work uh, showing how vascular growth factors impact uh, vascular development, but by extension, nearly every organ is impacted by this uh, work. Next slide. My lab has been asking, how can you engraft 
uh, new tissue into an adult kidney. This is a real challenge because the kidney is very complicated, but through stem cell biology, organoid technology, and also taking advantage of creatures that normally add new kidney tissue in an adult, the zebrafish, we've been able to define signals and tissues and cell types that participate in regenerative uh, new organ formation. So my lab is funded through the Rebuild a Kidney Consortium at the NIDDK, and we've just achieved another five years worth of funding from that with a new team to really start to take human stem cells and graft them into adult tissue uh, based on what we've learned from the fish. So uh, I think there's great potential in our basic systems of discovery to translate them into uh, real uh, impacts on human health. Next slide. The Kaufman lab looks at early life stress. It's a major factor in adult physiology. And he's showing how uh, the, the immune system can be impacted for the, the life of an individual based on simply early life or fetal stress. And it's not just affecting regenerative mechanisms that are shown here uh, with fin regeneration in the zebrafish model, but other uh, impacts are on the responses to environmental toxicity. Jim is funded for an RO3 from the NIH and is actively applying for RO1 funding and also looking to collaborate on uh, projects looking at environmental toxicity and how that can be impacted by early life stress. Next slide. Uh, Jared Rollins is uh, leading a charge into how uh, dietary restriction extends lifespan with a specific focus on an understudied area, which is how gene expression is regulated, not in the nucleus, but at the level of translation in the cytoplasm. And it's revealed a whole new set of longevity associated genes that are expressed but beyond that, he's looking at the mechanism for how dietary restriction can change what genes are expressed. Uh, and this, this process of looking at ribosomes, which are the machinery for making proteins, um, is broadly relevant to many, many disease states. Uh, how the switches on ribosomal proteins can alter where they are in the cell, what set of genes they turn into protein, which are the real effectors of, of cell phenotype or cell behavior. It's what proteins you make. So his work, he's actively applying. We've been in consultation. He's funded currently by the COBRI, but we've been working together on his aims for about, <clears throat> well, since I joined, <clears throat> excuse me. And we're optimistic for an R01 on his work. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Sam Beck is also funded on the COBRI right now, and he has pioneered this uh, uh, broad uh, bioinformatic approach to look at many, many data sets to uncover new features of age-related dysfunction. His work has shown that uh, basically a, a concept of transcriptional noise happens. You, cells become less able to control what genes they're expressing. Uh, and this sort of mis-expression of genes can lead to an age-related dysfunction, inflammation in aging, um, and what's great about Sam's work is he's looking beyond his, his aging model to see how it might affect specific disease models, for instance, Alzheimer's. And when you can take your own work or your, your system you've developed for one thing, find relevance in another system, uh, that's a real opportunity to uh, improve your funding. And uh, Sam and Jared have both applied for a supplement on the uh, COBRI grant that we're optimistic we'll see some new funding from. Next slide. You'll hear uh, after my introduction from uh, Prague Mirawal and James Godwin, both of them are uh, building a roadmap to figure out how to overcome limits on regeneration. Both of them work on limb regeneration uh, with unique focus. Uh, James, you'll hear about how the immune system impacts uh, digit tip regeneration and, and limb regeneration in the axolotl. Um, and from Priag, you'll hear about how, where are the sources of cells uh, that uh, contribute and how they change over time to do this remarkable patterning event that, that uh, rebuilds a limb in its original form, which to me is remarkable. Next slide, please. Our newest recruit is Romain Madeleine, and Romain is studying uh, stem cells in the uh, I and in the olfactory system, both neural stem cells. 
uh, and how they can regenerate tissue after injury. And his, his aims parallel my lab's aims, which are to take advantage of adult stem cells in the zebrafish, understand how they work, and engineer the same processes in human disease and injury conditions. And what we're discovering, I think, is that there's really not that much difference. Uh, the stem cells, at least in the, in the kidney and also in the nervous system, uh, carry a lot of the same genes expressed during development of the organs in mammals, and that by tweaking a few key steps, we may be able to really promote uh, regeneration from stem cells in, in mammals and humans. Next slide. Uh, Jane Disney is a remarkable leader in community outreach with a specific focus on uh, environmental toxicology and has done a fantastic job of, of uh, not only enabling students to engage in research, but uh, improving their health by uh, having them as change agents in their family for uh, improving the water in their households. Uh, Jane it will be uh, participating uh, with Bruce Stanton in, in grant applications in the future, and we're very optimistic in seeing her program grow. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we take this crew of superstars and make them better or make them more successful? And I think one way it's great about MDIBL is we've invested in cutting edge technology. Uh, the new two photon confocal we have in the, in the basement now as of last week uh, is hypersensitive, uh, can penetrate uh, deep tissue, look in live uh, living organisms and study individual cells. So there's, uh, the next slide shows an example of looking at a uh, calcium biosensor in a kidney. And basically the red dots show high intracellular calcium. And for people who don't know uh, biology that well, uh, these are cell signals. These are how cells communicate to each other. So we can study that in real time in living creatures now and ask how regenerating organs or disease states uh, affect cell signaling and, and really start to tease apart the level of complexity of this process at a single cell level. Next slide. In terms of single cell analysis, we've also invested in uh, what's called a flow cytometer and a single cell uh, RNA-seq library creation system. What this allows us to do is, again, looking at individual cells, we can ask, what are all the genes they express? Can we group cells together based solely on what we know about the, their pattern of gene expression? And that's what's represented here. All those little dots represent a single cell that has the same sort of set of genes expressed. It allows us to identify new cell types, understand changes in cells over a course of regeneration, and, and, and really start to pair uh, secreted factors and receptors or signaling systems between cells. There's a very exciting time and there's an explosion of interest in the single cell sequencing. I'm gonna use it to study how the kidney stem cells differentiate. Uh, James will probably be, will be using it to look at immune cell types in the limb. Uh, Priag will be looking at it in terms of how cells change uh, and differentiate during limb regeneration. And Herman will apply it to his organoids to ask how, what cell types are represented in this new uh, kidney structures created from stem cells. So there's a wealth of information and we can also expect a huge demand on our bioinformatics team for this. So we're, we're trying to keep Joel Graber very calm these days, but uh, he'll have a, a lot of interesting work to do. Uh, and he has also recruited new uh, faculty, new, um, staff scientists to manage some of this uh, new opportunity. Next slide. Uh, with Wistar Morris's help, we are establishing a new animal system. Uh, the African turquoise killifish is a short-lived fish, and this makes it practical to do studies like shown on the next slide, uh, where we can compare young and old creatures and ask how fast can they regenerate? How does aging affect uh, regeneration. So you can see in the top pink pictures the process of growing back the bones in a fin after amputation. But in an older creature towards the bottom of the slide, you'll see that the bone really doesn't grow back. We want to know why. We want to know how aging impacts regenerative pro properties. And uh, Eric Rogers is leading the charge with Wistar's support 
And it's really, we think, creating a nucleus for many labs to join in using this model. I'm interested in looking at how aging affects kidney regeneration. Herman wants to look at vascular changes. And I think others will find applications for this model. Um, a goal of mine is to establish pilot funding and broaden use of this model so that each lab could hire a person or a postdoc to do a project on it. And then uh, I think it's this model is still young and exciting enough that we at MDIBL could establish ourselves as an international center and meeting place for our work on this creature. And it's really growing worldwide. So the next slide. Uh, I've reorganized the animal facility to accommodate the, the demand for new and different animals with uh, Priag joining us. We'll expand the axolotl facility uh, with Eric starting the killifish. We'll commit space to that. But more importantly, this organizational structure allows input from all ends. So James and our scientific advisory board has introduced new ways to, to improve the food for the axolotls. And I often think that the most important uh, insights come from the front line. So the animal techs, uh, we have talent and Rachel Bramel, Ali, Austin, and Dimitri in terms of innovation and changing how we approach uh, management of the animals. Next slide, just a diagram of uh, where we're, we're consolidating the zebrafish and we have new zebrafish racks uh, to accommodate uh, Romaine Madeleine, my lab, Herman's lab. Uh, and Jim's lab. Uh, the ATK room in the lower left is committed. We can raise a thousand fish in that room. Uh, and we have uh, four actually axolotl rooms, two not shown. So we're expanding and committing a unique space to the axolotl. I think my last slide is about enabling discovery and lifespan assays. We've uh, invested in new equipment with uh, Jared Rollins collaborating with Sam Beck to look for drugs that extend lifespan. And this is uh, a challenge uh, because of the difficulty in, in, in uh, making the, the assays repeatable, making the avoiding artifact in terms of uh, just the culture conditions. And with this new equipment, it really uh, standardizes our approach, makes them rigorous uh, drug screens, and also allows us to screen up to 50 molecules for any one run. So this, I think, will uh, break new ground, and we are very excited to see our young investigators invest in this and benefit. So I thank you for your time. Uh, I, I took too long because what you really want to hear is straight from the faculty. We're going to hear from uh, James Godwin and Prag Murawala about their work on uh, limb regeneration and how Together, I think they, they bring the opportunity to create uh, MDIBL as a center for limb regeneration. Uh, James uh, has been here for several years as a joint appointment at the JACS, and at MDIBL, he's studying axolotl limb regeneration. Good, okay, so today I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, how MDIBL is using the salamander model to understand regeneration so that we can inform future strategies to unlock regeneration in mammals. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the background to my work and what happens in my lab. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how some of the synergistic activities between my lab and uh, Marawala lab that's joining MDIBL shortly. So um, I guess, one second. So the, 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 the big question is, so why, why study regeneration? Well, there's lots of interesting questions to, to, to try and tackle in biology. But for me, I think that regeneration is probably one of the, the most important things that are going to transform modern healthcare. And so it's the number one cause of death, trauma, trauma related injuries. And if you add up all the different types of trauma, it, you know, it out competes cancer, diabetes and heart disease in terms of the amount of economic loss in productivity. And if you add up all of the different injuries, um, it beats cancer if you include things like homicide and suicide. But, you know, there's a human cost to the lack of regeneration in humans. You know, things like 486,000 burn injuries in, in the USA in 2016. You know, nearly 80,000 spinal cord injuries in humans every year. One in four people die of cardiac um, sort of um, death because because they can't rep replace the heart muscle that gets damaged through through heart diseases 
And importantly for the, the talk that I'm giving today, there's 185,000 amputations every year in the USA, which is just mind boggling. So, you know, these are real clinical problems and humans are really bad at repairing tissues. And, and when those tissues affect your, your life or, or your mobility or, or quality of life, these are really significant. But have no fear, there's, there's possibly a way to fix it. Um, if we can understand how animals such as this wonderful creature can, can, can repair all these tissues, then we may be able to sort of improve human repair outcomes. So this guy is really staggering. You know, like you can damage the spinal cord, the legs won't work for like, you know, three weeks or so, and then slowly it'll repair itself and come back to normal. You can damage the telecephalon, parts of the eye, cut off parts of the jaws or cut off a third of the heart. All these tissues regenerate back to pretty much what they were to begin with. They do the standard things like muscle repair and liver repair that you and I will probably do. But these guys, you can, you can chop off a limb and it will replace that limb or the tail or it will heal scar free in, in any of its uh, cutaneous tissues. And so regrowing the limb is, is probably the oldest context in which regeneration has been studied. And it's such a fascinating process because if you look at the limb, it's got all of these different tissue types. You know, it's got bones, it's got uh, nerves, it's got muscle, it's got all the different types of connective tissues. And if you amputate that limb, um, this process is just, as, as Ian alluded to, is just magical. <clears throat> so the skin grows from the, from the, from the extremity of the, of the cut surface and crawls across that cut surface, involves uh, immune cells such as macrophages, and creates a specialized structure known as a wound epithelium. And then over the course of a few days, um, all of these mature tissues underneath, like the bone, the muscle, and all of the other um, types of tissues that, that are in the limb, start to lose their differentiated characteristics and form a pool of stem cells or progenitor cells that, um, if the nerve is present, will then expand and regrow into this structure known as a blastema. And that has all of the instructions that you need to regrow a limb. You can actually transplant that onto the back of another animal, give it a nerve supply, and you can grow a limb on the back of an animal. So this is a really important structure. If we can work out how, do we, how we get this, we may be able to do the same thing in humans. And of course, with time, these cells grow out, proliferate, expand, and then mature into the tissues that are required to replace the original structure. So I'm not gonna show the video because Ian kind of stole my thunder on that today, but the process is, is, is just to recap, it, it involves the immune system, it involves the skin growing over that surface, it involves the nerve. Now, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but what I wanna to bring to your attention is that regeneration happens in a bunch of different animals, but to various extents. And so the true champion of regeneration is this guy. He, as, I, as I mentioned, he can do limbs, tails, heart, spinal cords, retina. Um, it can even regenerate the spleen or pancreas or even parts of the testes or ovary, which is important for fertility research, but it has really hasn't been studied. And so when you look at things like the, the zebrafish, you, you know, these guys are extraordinary also. They do a range of things that regenerate. Um, of course, you know, my preference is the salamander. Uh, I think Prague would, would side with me on that. Um, but when you get to things like amniotes where lizards, they don't really regenerate limbs, despite what you see in Spider-Man movies. You know, they, they only can really regenerate the tail and it's really kind of a, a poor copy. It's a, it's, not, it's a bad reproduction. It's not like as perfect as what you would find in a fish or a salamander. Um, when we go towards mammals, we find that things like birds that can do sometimes can do beaks, male puffins. But when you get to mammals, you get, you know, the spiny mouse can do skin, regenerate skin and ear holes. They can do, when you get to humans, you get, you get like liver, blood and fingertips are about all we can do, as long as the male bed is preserved to the fingertip. And, and, and similar types of regeneration are found in the common mus musculus mouse. And so you get this spectrum of regenerative capacity across evolution. And interestingly, in mammals that don't have good regeneration, uh, as adults, we find that in very early stages of life, they can regenerate certain things like the heart at day one, but they lose it by day seven in a mouse. And so adult tissues are associated with tissue scarring where um, in, in young animals or in amphibians and fish, you, you get cell replacement without scarring. So when we compare growing a limb 
to regenerating a limb, there's a couple of really important differences, right? So obviously development of a limb starts with embryogenesis, um, but amputation uh, is required for the you know, regeneration of the limb and that brings with it immune cell invasion and an immune response. So these have different starting points, but interestingly, the end part of both of these processes, the redevelopment and differentiation phase of both of these contexts is very similar. Now we don't really know how similar because the tools weren't really available. Um, Prague will talk about some of the new tools that allow some of these questions to be addressed, but really we don't really know if development and redevelopment are the same. Uh, we don't know if the cells used to replace missing tissue are exactly the same as those in development. And I don't, I, I don't think they, they really are. And uh, we also don't know how the immune system becomes compatible with these systems in adults. And most importantly, we don't know how this process really kicks off because this is a, an embryonic process and this is an, a process that occurs in an adult tissue. So all these are really important questions that, that really could improve our understanding of how to improve regeneration in humans. So my work is, is really like focused on the role of these immune cells called macrophages. So if you get rid of these macrophages prior to amputation, what happens is instead of getting this beautiful limb regenerating from, from the animal, adult animal, you end up with this scarred stump, which underneath, if you look underneath this, this tissue here, you get this horrible, dense collagen deposition known as scar tissue or fibrosis. And here's a, a, a nice image that I find you can kind of, this is reflective polarized light showing how these thick ropey collagen strands are basically bouncing light off to show how dense and, and cross-linked it is. So without macrophages, this is what you get. So humans get a similar thing. So it's very interesting that you get rid of macrophages and they end up more like us. So how are these macrophages helping? It's, it's, it's kind of important to know, right? And so the, there we go. Oh, sorry. There we go. So the, um, when you get rid of macrophages in the skin, these cells known as myofibroblasts, which is kind of like the bad guys of scar tissue formation. These are the ones which were pumping out or, or releasing this collagen uh, to, to form this, this scar tissue network. And when you get rid of macrophages, these, these, these cells appear. And that, that's a, a trait which is conserved between both uh, salamander skin and limb regeneration. Um, and also in the heart. So if you get rid of macrophages and then injure the heart, instead of being restricted to the outside, you get this, these, these myofibroblasts popping up everywhere inside the injured tissue. So what this work has shown us is that if you want to promote organ and tissue regeneration in humans, we really first need to overcome the problem of fibrosis. So we have to understand how fibrosis basically puts up a barrier towards human regeneration. And so it's really interesting. If you look in mammalian uh, tissues, what you find is that macrophages are probably seen as the bad guys in this, in this scenario. So macrophages are well known to actually promote formation of myofibroblasts from their precursors. So in this picture here, what you see is this is just fibroblasts in culture. And you can see the odd cell shown here in green that's, that's staining for a marker that tells us that it's a myofibroblast. But if you co-incubate with macrophages shown in red, you see that all of these, these innocent fibroblast-like cells become these scar-producing myofibroblasts in culture. So this is kind of a bit of a, bit of a conundrum because these macrophages in salamanders seem to be doing the opposite of what they do in, in mouse or human. And so it's interesting if you look at the types of macrophages that are in mouse and human, there's a bunch of different types of macrophages and they can be activated in different ways. And this is shown in a, in a color demonstration here. So, you know, you can get macrophages that form this spectrum of different colored macrophages, all with different phenotypes, which have different roles. So it is possible that within this rainbow of macrophages that are in the human body, one of these macrophages could be an anti-scarring macrophage, but it could be outnumbered by a range of bad macrophages. So it's kind of interesting that we really do need to know a lot more about 
good macrophages versus bad macrophages, those that promote scar tissue formation and those that resist scar tissue formation. So obviously one of the first things we wanted to do is look at in comparative biology to see if salamander macrophages are the same or behave similarly to mammalian macrophages. And if, and if they do, how do they suppress fibrosis? So some of our, our work has shown that, you know, if you take macrophage precursors and you stimulate them with, with, with uh, damage, damage stimuli, so basically a, a stimulus that you would find during an injury, axolotl macrophages basically shut off gene expression of particular genes that show their phenotype as, as what we call M1. And so in, in mouse macrophages, it's the opposite. So in the bottom panel here, what we see is a heat map. So yellow is on and blue is off. And these are three different signaling pathways. And in red, in the top, in the top square, what we find is that with these different stimuli, axolotl seems to behave very different to mouse. And, and mouse is very similar to human. So we do have a divergence in the responses between macrophages, clearly showing us that there's something about the way that these macrophages respond to injury that is divergent in evolution, which we could learn from and potentially harness or exploit in human therapies. So I mentioned earlier in my talk that the, the, the nerve is critical for regeneration. So if you cut the nerve that feeds into the limb, uh, you actually get re regeneration failure. So, to, you know, the blastema fails to, to sort of expand and, and be functional. And, you, and uh, what's interesting is that, you know, it's becoming more and more apparent that, that macrophage nerve interactions are part of this process. And by binding to, to these nerves, we can actually get release of, of neurotransmitters, morphogens and growth factors that could probably drive regeneration. But really, we don't know much about how these macrophages influence regeneration. So part of my work is to understand how macrophages can both influence the, the fibrotic aspect and also the neurotrophic aspect of nerve signaling. So, uh, sorry, it's a bit slow for some reason. Okay, so there's a lot on this slide, but basically I just want to point out that there's a lot of things we don't know. So in regeneration, the origins of the progenitor cells that will rebuild the limb. We don't really know how all this works. And a lot of Prayag's work is, uh, the Marawala lab is, is, is looking at these, these differentiation pathways to see how these blastemas can contribute to a limb and, and really inform us of how these, these limbs are rebuilt in an adult animal outside of embryogenesis. And so there's obviously some synergy here because um, in understanding how macrophages can suppress fibrosis, we have to understand what sort of cells can actually produce fibrosis. So if this guy here is the myofibroblast, this is the villain in fibrosis. Well, there's lots of different cells, fibroblasts, epithelial cells, fibrocytes, and these vascular uh, smooth muscle cells, which can all be transformed into these scar producing progenitors. So we really don't know what the influence of macrophages are on all of these progenitors, and we need to track which ones are contributing to the process, and hence why it, it creates opportunities for both the Marwella lab and the Godwin lab to, to work together. So this is a kind of a, a, a Venn diagram of, of, of how we can actually synergize our activities at uh, MDIBL. So in my lab, we're really focused on macrophage phenotype and function regeneration. What is the genetic basis of macrophage dependent fibrotic suppression and how those scar progenitors are regulated. And of course, macrophage nerve interactions that are supporting that. And downstream of that, how immune cell regulation can regulate the matrix, the, 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 the non-cellular component that surrounds cells in, in regeneration. And the Marawala lab is, is really focused on looking at the genetic regulation of progenitor cell identity, the expansion and differentiation, uh, has projects with thyroid hormone control of regeneration, tendon regeneration, and understanding how these different connective tissue cells can, can integrate into a regrowing limb. And of course, fibroblast signaling centers that control regeneration. So this creates a perfect overlap in which we can both tackle some of the bigger issues between fibroblast macrophage nerve interactions, how we can sort of track the origin of scar progenitors, whether thyroid um, pathways affected by macrophages. And of course, we can both 
uh, share tools and, and, and push the, the, the projects further by, by uh, developing new tools together. So I'll finish my talk there. Uh, I just want to um, acknowledge people in my lab, um, importantly, the funding from the NIH as the part of the COBRA project, um, the, the administration at MDIBL, which has been very supportive to our work, um, the core facility uh, support, such as from Joel Graber and his team, the animal core support. And I'd also like to give a shout out to the, the Tau Graduate Fellowship, which supported a six month internship from a French master's student in my lab this year, which was very successful and top the year. So with that, I, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. And Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. okay. Fantastic. Okay, I'll try to be as short and quick as possible. Uh, I'm Prayag Murawala. I'm a new recruit and I have a joint appointment between MDIBL and Hanover Medical School. And uh, the thing that I would like to talk about is the tools development in Axolotl that really accelerates uh, our work uh, in studying limb regeneration. And James has done fantastic job introducing the tissue regeneration. So uh, moving to the uh, Axolotl tools, I'll be talking about two main tools today, uh, which helps us uh, with the genetic and molecular aspects of the Axolotl uh, tissue regeneration. So the first one is tissue clearing. Tissue clearing works on a simple principle, and that is uh, making the refractive index match between various components that resides in an organ. Here, for your uh, simplicity, we have a flask that is filled up with beads, and you cannot see what's behind this flask. And this is because beads and air have ref different refractive index, and that is why light gets scattered, and you cannot see what's behind it. Now, if I were to fill up uh, this flask, uh, if I were to fill up this flask with water, you can start seeing what lays behind this flask. And this is because the beads and water have a similar refractive index. And the gentleman behind is the person who introduced the concept of tissue clearing to the field. So using a similar principle, we have managed to clear large entire organism, for example, zebrafish and axolotl. And you can see here that we are able to image the entire nervous system of these animals. We have done so using a, a custom built light sheet microscope, which creates a very thin sheet of light that illuminates an entire plane of an organism, which can then be captured using a very low magnification objective. Using this, I'm showing you a, a one a small video that shows a entire nervous system of axolotl. You can see here forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain, and spinal cord. And you can see individual neurons that are projecting into different part of the axolotl. The second tool that I would like to introduce is axolotl transgenesis. In Elitanaka's lab, where I was a postdoc in the past, we have invested heavily in developing various transgenesis methods, for example, uh, ISC1, TOL2, CRISPR knock-ins, and knockout. And we are now able to successfully knock in even up to five KB cassettes into the axolotl genome. This allows us to, to label tissue of interest using fluorescent reporters, Cree reporters, Cree drivers, etc. Et and that allows us to image them in, in a live setting so that we can understand how tissue regeneration proceeds. Using similar approach, we developed some tools that allow limbs to be labeled. And, and here you can see that fibroblasts uh, are labeled, and then combining this transgenesis with modern technology, such as single cell transcriptomics, we are able to understand how fibroblasts contribute during axolotl limb regeneration. In one of the last work that we have done, uh, we showed that fibroblast cells de-differentiates, acquires progenitor status or become a stem cell, and this progenitor cell then go on and contribute to various connective tissue lineage in the limb. The, the major paradigm shift here through this work is that in humans or in mammals, we know that only periskeletal cells are capable of making skeletal cells and only tenocytes are capable of making more tenocytes which form tendons. Now, we have identified that a unique cell fibroblast which is also present in mammals is capable or it can act as an additional uh, cellular source 
for this different uh, uh, important uh, tissues in the limb and across the body, for example, bone and tendons. With this, I would like to bring you to the future direction of my lab that will work at MDIBL. Uh, we are interested in molecular mechanisms of limb and tail regeneration, just like James. And for that, we will heavily collaborate with James. Uh, uh, and we have written multiple grants. The first grant is on tendon regeneration, which is approved by DFG. We have just received it uh, in last month. The second grant is about role of thyroid pathway in limb regeneration, which we have submitted as a COBRI grant to the NIH. And then in future, uh, similar to James, we are interested to understand how fibroblast in accordance with the, with the signaling center uh, uh, controls the, or contributes to the limb regeneration. And the signaling centers are epidermis, nervous system, and immune system. And we will be heavily, heavily collaborating with Godwin Lab at MDIBL to dissect out or tease out how exactly limb regeneration in agroglottal proceeds. And with this, I would like to acknowledge the people in my lab, which is a virtual lab right now. Uh, Marco is a clearing uh, expert. Lydia is virtually running the lab. She's actually present at MDIBL and she is uh, running my lab. I'm not there. Uh, Sophia is a new PhD student. Uh, I would like to thank uh, MHH, uh, Hanover Medical School and MDIBL and funding source DFG NIH, and currently I'm at IMP, and uh, my collaborators. Thank you very much. I hope I was Thank you. Thanks so much, and thanks so much for um, giving us uh, such a good view of your work and uh, interest in coming here and where you'll fit in in such a short period of time. I'm sorry to have had to truncate your presentation, but. Uh, we will be sure you get first billing at our next our next meeting uh, with extensive pre-marketing. So, Thank you. <laughs> so th thanks very much for your patience and for such a great job. So um, uh, Ian or uh, Herman, any anything further before we adjourn? But, <clears throat> well, thank you very much. I'll try to be very brief. The two of them were very modest. The combination of Priak and got, uh, uh, James, we are now one of the centers for limb regeneration, not only on the East Coast, but uh, worldwide. And I think this came across nicely. And Great job. So um, if there is no old or new business anyone wants to bring up, hearing none, uh, I would like to have a move for adjournment. So, so good. Good.